Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to this candidates forum for the Sleepy Hollow mayoral election. My name is Susan Maggiato and I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of the River Towns. We are so pleased to be partnering tonight with Disability Rights New York to provide both American Sign Language interpretation and live closed captioning in English and Spanish. To see the closed captions, you can click the three dots button on your bottom labeled more, choose captions, and then show captions. To see the captions in Spanish, please go to the website in the box on the screen where you can see it up it's in my left corner. I don't know where it is on yours, but if you go to that website, um, you will can view the captions in stream text in your web browser. Use the language button in the toolbar at the top to toggle down to Spanish to view the Spanish captions. This evening, you will have the opportunity to listen to the candidates' views on issues of importance to the Sleepy Hollow community so that you can make an informed decision when you vote on March 21st. I welcome the two candidates for mayor, incumbent mayor Kenneth Ray and his opponent, Martin Rutna. Please note that there are three people running for three trustee positions. Since it is the policy of the league not to hold forums for unopposed elections, there will not be a forum for trustees. Our moderator tonight is Alice Tenney, a member of the Larchmont Mamaroneck League and a resident of Larchmont. Our timekeeper is Ryan Tribal, a student member of the Newcastle League. Ryan is a senior at Horace Greeley High School in Chappaqua. We have another student with us as well, Gigi Bragg, who is a member of our own River Towns League and a junior at Dobbs Ferry High School. Gigi is going to provide an introduction to the forum for us. Okay. Since 1920, the League of Women Voters has been a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to protect and expand voting rights and ensure everyone is represented in our democracy. We empower voters and defend democracy through advocacy, education, and litigation at the local, state, and national levels. The League does not support or oppose candidates or political parties. The League is fully committed to ensure compliance in principle and in practice with the national organization's diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. Membership is open to everyone 16 years of age or older. Starting as a student involved in school organizations such as Student Government and Women Empowerment Club, I realized that there was a lot to be done outside of the classroom in order to help spread the devotion to my peers. Although I knew I was going to be the youngest person in the room, I joined the League of Women Voters River Towns and was welcomed with enthusiasm and open arms. My first project was a lesson to Girl Scouts on the importance of voting. And this is a very special moment because it showed me how important it is to enlighten the youth about democratic issues. Because of this, I even began convincing my classmates and friends to join. Further, the league helped me to accomplish my goals such as the Students Inside Albany Conference coming up in May, which is gonna directly teach me about the legislative process in New York. I'm extremely grateful for what the league has shown me, the impact that a group of passionate people who care about a cause can make and I'm excited to see and be a part of the league's future accomplishments. I ask that candidates here tonight will consider the importance of young vo voices as the league has if elected. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gigi. I just want to say a word about our recording policy. All the candidates have agreed to this. Only entities licensed, um, authorized by the league may record or live stream this forum and only licensed media which includes TV, radio, and newspapers are entitled by FCC regulations to air portions of the recording. Anyone else who broadcasts or streams the recording must do so in its entirety. This is to ensure that the content of the forum will not be manipulated in any way to create false or misleading impressions of any candidate. The forum will be recorded and available for later viewing. There will be links on the River Towns League website and Facebook page to the location on YouTube. And with that, I will turn the forum over to our moderator, Alice Tenney. Good evening. Um, as Susan said, I'm Alice Tenney. I'll be tonight's moderator. Uh, and as she uh, mentioned, I am not a voter in this district. 
So as the league requires, I am completely nonpartisan in this contest. Tonight's forum will follow the league's traditional format, beginning with an opening statement from each candidate, followed by a question and response period and finishing up with closing statements from each candidate. The order of the candidates opening statements has been determined by lot. The reverse order will be used for their closing statements. Opening and closing statements are not to exceed one minute. Audience questions have been collected by email prior to tonight's forum and a committee of league members has reviewed and sorted the questions keeping in mind the relevance to the office and the specifics of this race. I will address each candidate, each question, excuse me, to each candidate, after which the candidate may take up to one and a half minutes to respond. Our timekeeper will be visible on the screen and will alert the moderator and the candidate when 30 seconds of response time are remaining, and then again when it is time to stop. The candidate will be allowed to finish a sentence once he has started. Candidates are each allowed two rebuttals over the course of the evening, and rebuttal time is limited to, to 30 seconds. There will be no responses to rebuttals. After the closing statements, I reserve the right to grant a rebuttal then if it is de deemed necessary. Uh, finally, the candidates will not interrupt each other or the moderator during the forum. And as a moderator, I reserve the, the right to pause or if necessary, halt the proceedings to enforce the ground rules and format. Please note that the candidates have not been provided with any of the questions ahead of time. Finally, except for the time limits, the only restriction on candidate statements and answers is respect and civility. Um, and finally, please note that election day is next Tuesday, March 21st. Polls will be open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. And if you are curious or confused as to where your polling place is, please visit vote411.org um, and you'll be able to figure out your polling place. So with that, uh, prior to the forum, um, I randomly picked the order of the candidates to start, and uh, Ken will give his opening statement first. Please start. Thank you. As your mayor, I can point to a strong record of making our village better. For 14 years, I've led Sleepy Hollow through some very complex and thorny issues. Here's where I started. Property taxes were increasing at a rate of 9% per year. Our police department was under federal investigation. The state declared our water reserves presently inadequate and unsafe. No development, not one new home could be built until the reserves increased by a million and a half gallons. And when GM pulled up stakes, we were fast becoming another decrepit factory town. But together we had a vision, we had a plan. Today, with public-private partnerships, a stable tax base, and significant investments by New York State, Sleepy Hollow is rising. We have more to do. I'm asking for your vote to continue leading our extraordinary transformation. Thank you. Um, and now, Martin, your opening statement, please. Hello, my name is Martin Rutna. I'm the Executive Director of Marketing in an automotive consulting company. I'm married to my wonderful wife, Shanna, and we together live in Sleepy Hollow and Weber Park. Before that, we lived in Italy, Detroit, and Nashville. But I can proudly say that Sleepy Hollow is the best place that I've ever called home. I recently had an ex a bizarre experience. I, came, I left the corporate boardroom and went to a village meeting and felt excluded. It was that experience that drove my candidacy for mayor. I believe as a lifelong Democrat that village government should be accountable to the people, responsive and transparent in everything it does. My belief and my vision for the village of Sleepy Hollow is the revitalization of Beekman Avenue, the removal of empty storefronts. And I don't wanna change our DNA, but work together to make us a better Sleepy Hollow tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, question number one to Ken first. 
What do you think are the two biggest challenges facing the village? The two biggest challenges facing the village are continuing to see the um, Edge on Hudson development um, follow through and get built out, um, and then incorporating, uh, and, and part of that is incorporating the new folks, the new residents from Edge on Hudson into the rest of our village, integrating them, these uh, newcomers, uh, to the rest of the village. The second big challenge is um, continuing the development that the village has chosen to do on the property that we gained as part of the GM site, uh, and that is our new common. Um, and that is going to flow from the first one, um, and we need to make sure that we can continue um, to get the development underway so that we can do our other projects. That includes new parklands, um, new recreation spaces, uh, new infrastructure for the village, all of which is critical to bringing the village together um, as one village. We've never really had a downtown in the sense of one place where everybody in the village could come together. And that's what the Commons going to do for us. So I think it's really critical that we um, complete that work. Thank you, Martin. The two biggest challenges facing the village. Thank you. I believe the two biggest challenges start with revitalization of our downtown. We've had the empty storefronts on Beekman Avenue for over 10 years. We've had we've had empty uh, lots for almost as long. We've had you know trash and other things in the streets that we need to take the time to revitalize that area and focus on that diversification of our economy. I agree that we need to then also make sure that we can do more than one thing at a time. We need to build a walk and chew bubble gum, for one might say. We need to not just focus on the village of, of Sleepy Hollow's downtown of Beekman, but also finishing and integrating the rest of, this, of the waterfront and making sure that everything there is available and designed for not just one part of our village inside of our common, but everyone inside the village. We can do that by integrating and utilizing our LDC. Our local development corporation has an opportunity to have over 50, up to 15 people on it. Currently, we only have four. I think we need to take the opportunity to expand the inclusion of our village, give more voice to the other community members, and make sure that everyone has a voice in how that new parkland will be developed. Thank you. On to our second question, and uh, Martin will answer first. The disability community is said to be the largest minority community in the world. It's also full of diversity and spans the economic spectrum. What do you want to do to incorporate disability issues into your work as an elected leader? Great question. I, also, I believe that first we should be following all, all parts of the ADA Act from the federal government. That includes not just the basics of curb walks and available walk signals and things like that, but also including um, WCAG standards for uh, readability on our websites and using technology to make our, our messages easier and more transparent for our public. ADA and, and ability doesn't stem just from what we're doing on the technology front, but also into how we develop our, our new spaces, making sure that our parks are accessible to everyone, that we are providing economic um, opportunities to not just a few, but everyone in the community and treating everyone equal in every part of our day-to-day -day lives as a village. That transparency and accountability you'll hear me bring up multiple times because it's important to make sure everyone is included in the prosperity that has been coming inside of Sleepy Hollow and we've worked so hard to have. Thank you. Thank you. Ken, would you like me to repeat the question? Um, sure. Uh, I mean, please. Uh, the disability community is said to be the largest minority community in the world. It's also full of diversity and spans the economic spectrum. What do you want to do to incorporate disability issues into your work as an elected leader? Thank you. Um, we can continue doing some of the things that Martin just um, mentioned uh, for physical disabilities, as well as uh, continuing to do the kinds of things that we've done in in parts of our downtown to make sure that the visually impaired and um, hearing impaired uh, are properly um, uh, kept safe um, in our intersections and our sidewalks and other parts of our downtown 
Um, the um, an area that that people don't often think about is something um, that is the interaction between um, our emergency services and uh, disabled people. And we have a program that's been underway for a while through our police department to identify, voluntarily identify households that have disabled people in them so that when a police officer or an emergency worker shows up, they understand that there's somebody who is disabled in that household and they understand how to uh, interact with that person. Uh, I know there's been some really tragic circumstances around the country where those kind of um, measures are not put in place and, and they led to some real tragedies. So our police department has been forward thinking, we've been forward thinking and making sure that that's part of how we do our work here in Sleepy Hollow. Thank you. Uh, question number three, um, back to you, Ken. Uh, Sleepy Hollow is one of six villages in Westchester that still has March elections. Do you support moving the elections to coincide with the general election in November? No, I do not. Um, uh, it, it, I'll say that again. No, I do not. Um, I think it's um, great that we have our elections um, uh, separate, essentially, from the rest of the uh, election cycle. What it means is that village residents can focus on who's running for trustee or mayor and sort of blank out all the other stuff. Um, one of the concerns that I would have is when there's a national ticket, especially in, in a presidential year, um, that people would go into the booth and say, I'm voting for this line or that line and work their way down through. And we're going to be all the way down there on the bottom um, after everything else. Are they even going to remember to vote for us when they get that far down? And I think we, the, the in addition to that, we kind of get lost in, in that shuffle. The focus then is on senatorial candidates or governors or presidents, uh, congressional candidates, and not on us here in the village. Um, I'm part of Unite Sleepy Hollow, which is a nonpartisan uh, political committee that incorporates uh, Democrats and Republicans and uh, unaffiliated voters. We select um, among ourselves the people we think are best for the village, regardless of political orientation. And I think we'd get um, that would all get lost in in a fall election. Uh, Martin, uh, do you favor moving the elections to November? I do. I actually believe that moving the elections to November will increase inclusivity for the village, increase representation, because it shouldn't be difficult to know what's going on in the government. It's hard to remember that our elections are on March 21st, this upcoming Tuesday, don't forget. Um, and it makes it very difficult for people to remember to show up to vote, to look and to listen. And as a non-incumbent, I can tell you that it definitely impacts the ability for me to reach out to people because they're not expecting that political message. I want people in the village to be transparent. That transparency can goes to elections. We move into November, people know and expect those things. We are lucky. There's no one on this ticket that's running as a Democrat or Republican. We're all running on independent uh, lines. And I think that should continue. That it doesn't have a place in village politics. What we should be doing is making sure that we allow everyone to be represented, whether you live in the inner village, in the manors, up in Kendall, or anywhere else, we want to make sure that you have that representation easily and simply. And then what, what I want to do is make sure that inclusion also extends further and we should start bringing in term limits. I'm a big proponent of four uh, term limits, meaning four times as any position in the village government, and then it's time to move on. I think that change provides new face, new, new, uh, new vision, and new thoughts into our village leadership. Well, Martin, you just answered the next question, uh, which is all about term limits. I can give you time again. The, quest, the, the actual question is, are you in favor of term limits? If so, how many years should an elected official serve before stepping down? If you feel you've already said so, you may defer to Ken. I'll never give up time today. Uh, Ken, uh, I joked about that to begin with. Um, <laughs> I'll hit it again. Yes, that's uh, four term limits. That means a total of eight years. It's the same number that the president of the United States has. I think it's a very reasonable one. Um, 
and ensures turnover. Um, while we have continuity, which is the big concern many people have about um, you know, term limits, we have the advantage of having one, off cycle elections it means only three trustees are elected each uh, two year term. So we have continuity in that manner, but we also have a long standing set of uh, village uh, employees and department heads. Uh, whether it's the chief of the police, your uh, village administrator, your treasurer or your clerk, they've all in this in recent time been very uh, long serving I think there's an advantage of providing that history and that continuity that allows for the leadership the mayor and the trustees to turn over to create different views. When you walk into a house after 10 years of living there, you might not notice small things that are different. You might not notice that cracked paint or other things, but when you come into it fresh and new, you really see what can be improved. You create a different plan, you create action to improve it. And that is why I think term limits are so important. The ongoing improvement of the village and towards our long-term goals. Ken, are you in favor of term limits? And if so, how many years before uh, required to step down? Uh, no, I am not. Um, a few decades ago, I was, um, because in New York State, you might not know this, um, Martin, but we didn't have term limits um, before. Um, and uh, the uh, we had kind of de facto term limits. Um, it was an incumbent... Uh, 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 priority process, it was incredibly difficult to get on the ballot all over the state, almost regardless of what the position was. Uh, whole teams of lawyers that would make sure it was really, really difficult to get on the ballot to, to even run for office. Um, those, those laws and procedures were changed that makes it really easy. Here in the village, you need 100 signatures of registered voters. Um, as you well know, it's pretty simple. It's pretty easy um, to get on the ballot. And what that means to me is that we do have term limits already. You have to get elected or reelected. Um, so it, it, the voters are going to decide you're doing a good job. And if they think you are, they're going to reelect you. Um, I would also point out just on, on the previous point, um, we've had March elections for decades. So the people in Sleepy Hollow know and are used to March elections. It's not a surprise to folks who live here. Thank you. Um, next question, um, Ken, you're, you're up first. If you are elected, will the Board of Trustees may, meetings be made available to the public on Zoom? Um, when we enter another pandemic, <laughs> uh, which hopefully, no, we won't, um, who knows? Uh, that would be something that we would certainly consider. Um, to, uh, I guess, the, another way of answering that question is no, but, as opposed to yes, but, um, the current um, ability to do things in Zoom has been um, difficult um, it, in that uh, when you have the board in the room and somebody coming in um, through Zoom or WebEx or whatever the system may be, uh, there are technical difficulties that I would like to see ironed out before we went there. Uh, for me, having been through that several times, um, the feedback and other kind of technical issues that come up is really, really annoying. Uh, the delays between a speaker that's on, on Zoom or WebEx and us in the room is also annoying. Uh, before we go there, um, I would really want to see the technology cleaned up and, and really... Um, uh, much more functional, uh, functional, functional, excuse me, uh, for us. And um, so I would say no, but. Thank you. Uh, Martin, will Board of Trustees meetings be open and available on Zoom? That's a, a simple answer. That's yes. In fact, I don't think that's far enough. Um, I think transparency is the simple and easiest way we can drive inclusion in our village making it easier to see what's going on, having a visual record of every meeting and every decision. So people make it convenient for them to understand what's going on and feel like they are engaged in our, our uh, government process like we want them to be. It goes beyond just taping the, the meetings up. Let's make the agendas available online on every Friday, preceding the overall, preceding the meeting on Tuesday so that people have time to understand what's going on, make all the prep notes available with it as well. So that way, we can ensure that people are included 
And if they have questions, they know to show up. We know that they can come in. They can represent themselves on Zoom or anywhere else. I've been working remotely personally since 2017. And I can tell you, without a doubt, I've been able to do it successfully and honestly easier than it was to go into the office. I think the mix of those two to show up for certain parts is a huge advantage. So the technology is already there. And we should use that to make sure that anyone can be convenient and understand when they want to be included or how they want to be included in village government. Thank you. Moving on, uh, Martin. As development at EDGE on Hudson continues, what mechanisms are in place to assess and respond to the ongoing impacts of traffic, traffic, parking, and resource usage? That's a great question. Um, there are a lot of things that are done. So EDGE on Hudson is a, is a long-standing project that started a long time ago, I believe right around long before uh, I was resident in the village. They have done complete uh, final environmental impact studies that for the traffic uh, as part of that process, they set up uh, rules and uh, expectations for it. So as we increase the square footage available in Agent Hudson, there are traffic remediation processes that are already in place. In fact, we've already just about ready to reach the first one of them at 300,000 square feet, where we should start uh, adjusting and uh, accounting for the intersection at the corner of Beekman and Pecanico as one of the ones identified by the traffic study. Additionally, we have made changes to our water to increase our water capacity um, in recent years. We have also uh, need to do more though. Currently, we only have one of our two tanks in the top of the hill available. One of those is still waiting relining and waiting for repair of an existing water line into the lower village and is not currently full. I think we need to make a change to that so we have make sure we have our state required 24 hours of available water and then also continue to drive parking and what you hit there is a very big part of my opinion for the revitalization of Beekman. We need to work with other municipalities, uh, our Board of Education to start looking at better ways to improve parking at Beekman Avenue. It's been a place and a limiting factor for economic and commercial development for way too many, many years and to be able to accommodate the people in Edge on Hudson we're gonna to need to make some very drastic changes. Those are things Thank we you. should bring. Uh, your time is up, Martin. Thank you. Ken, the development at Edge on Hudson, what mechanisms are in place to assess and respond to the ongoing impacts of traffic, parking, and resource usage? Um, first of all, um, Edge on Hudson has over 500 public parking spaces on the street, what we required uh, as part of their ability to build there. Um, in addition to the private parking spaces in each one of the multifamily buildings and the private parking spaces in the driveways and the garages of the townhouses. So we built in significant uh, parking uh, um, uh, for the entire project um, up front. Uh, and that's being built as they move forward. I think the most important thing um, for uh, traffic and traffic related issues is um, our intention to build another bridge in and out of um, Edge on Hudson. And that is an extension of Continental Street as it comes down through uh, the East Parcel, now dubbed the Common, over the Metro North tracks and into Edge on Hudson. Uh, and that will accomplish two things. It provides another way out of the project. Um, so that people coming up Continental Street will end up on Route 9 in, in front of the Restoration or Historic Hudson Valley. And critically, two other things. It provides um, a way in and out for our emergency services if anything happens on Lower Beekman. And it opens up the riverfront so that the park is accessible to everyone in the village. Thank you. Can I have a rebuttal on that? Um, yes, you may. The Continental Bridge is, yes, something that we think we should definitely look into, but we have not taken the time to A, do the traffic studies for it. We have also not taken the time to really communicate with the people on Continental Street or the other impacted parts of Pecanico to understand how that will change the change of the flow of traffic inside our village. These are things we need to do in a decisive action plan that are not reactive and, and also clearly shared. We need to be more communicative with our village as they're all brand new, and many of them are brand new, and we need to make sure Thank the understanding you. is changing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on to our next question. 
Um, Ken, first, what is proposed for the East Parcel Project? What is the total cost to the village and how is it being financed? What is proposed is um, a, a really spectacular plan, a great plan that came out of a very public years long process of village residents uh, weighing in on what they wanted to see on that 28 acres. Um, eight of the acres um, are set aside for the use of um, historic Hudson Valley. That was part of the original deal that predates all of us uh, being on the current board. Um, but what will be there is our DPW facility is being moved off of the waterfront uh, and up into the back of the common. Uh, and that's been the plan for a very long time. That will help fund the project uh, because we'll be able to sell the property that D DPW is on right now. Um, total cost right now, we're looking at 75 to $80 million for the pieces that include the DPW, uh, new recreation fields, including a full-size soccer field, new passive parkland, and the bridge itself. Uh, future plans, not in that number, include potentially a new recreation center, a building, uh, and an emergency uh, services um, place. The funding for that is multiple sources. Part of it is the new tax revenue from uh, Edge on Hudson, in addition to $10 million in development fees that are coming in, and significant grants that we've already see, received and expect to see, receive from New York State. Thank you. Thank you. Martin, what is proposed for the East Parcel Project? What's the cost to the village and how will it be financed? The East Parcel is gonna be a wonderful park that one solves our, our, our uh, insufficient uh, DPW garage that is currently in place on River Street and moves that into the East Parcel. It'll also be an opportunity for us as a community to create a new safe space, a new community space for our village. That is a, something I want to make sure we do together. Our LDC, yet again, can only have, only has four members on it. We can have up to 15. We can bring members from Weber Park, from each of the manors, from the waterfront district, from the inner village, and from everywhere else in the village to ensure that our community, that individual space is designed for everyone in the community. It, it accommodates people, not just uh, individuals, but parents, for biking, for walking, and it represents our idea of what the village should be. It's just been a long time since we've made that change. What is it gonna cost? I think it's about 50% more than what they originally estimated in the comprehensive plan. And that's a lot. That's something we should yet again, communicate back to the village and make some decisions together because long-term high debt will impact our ability to do things on the revitalization of Beekman, to buy properties and to expand parking. It really limits our ability to adapt as a village into the future. And I think we need to be more fiscally responsible in how we lay out the design and plan for that park. Maybe we have to do it over an extended period of time and ensure that it is representative of what we as a community want and desire. Thank you. Can, uh, I, can, I, just, can I do a rebuttal, please? Yes, of course. It, more in the form of a quick um, correction. Uh, the LDC um, has no need for a DPW or a park or an athletic field or a rec center. The LDC is a tool that we created to help us build the things that the village decide that we, our neighbors, in a process that you chose not to be part of, but in a process that we went through to decide what's going to be there. We tell the LDC what we want to build, and then they implement for us. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin, what is the plan for the property at 195 Beekman Street that the village has purchased? 195 Beekman for everyone here is the old uh, UAW building. Um, right now, I believe they have an opportunity for commercial development on it as they also create an extension for the Clinton Street. So move, meaning Clinton will extend along the train tracks where the old viaduct used to be and down into the uh, Sleepy Hollow Common and up into Continental Street. That, villa, that is currently slated as a special zoning district, I believe, um, and they're out uh, commit, uh, trying to find developers for that. For me, I think we need to make sure we look at this at the long term. That individual project needs to be fit inside of our village, our vision for the village, 
It needs to be, you know, have vision sheds accounted for. It needs to not be sacrificing parking in that very heavily, uh, dis uh, 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 the heavily inhabited place. There's a lot of people who live there and a lot of parking that happens. We need to make sure that when we build it, it feels like Sleepy Hollow. It is part of our DNA and we're not sacrificing short-term liquidity but instead prioritizing a, a project that'll be a cornerstone of Beekman Avenue on the lower side for decades to come. We really need to make sure that when we do develop that property, we pick the right developer, we set the right expectations for them. We don't incentivize short-term profitability, but something that really works for our community, creates the commercial district and really is another anchor on Beekman Avenue to draw people from the waterfront district up Beekman Avenue and into our center village. Thank you. Ken. What is the plan for the property at 195 Beekman that the village has purchased? Uh, two, two pieces to that. One is um, to extend um, the uh, street down from uh, Beekman Avenue into the East Parcel so that in into the common, so it would loop around and come out on Continental Street. So it's essentially extend Clinton Street from across Beekman Avenue through the um, eastern portion of that site. Um, so a new road that provides, again, another way for people out coming in and out of um, the Edge on Hudson development or Ichabod's or Riverhouse or the future development where DPW is going to be. So they don't have to come up Beekman Avenue. So again, it's a way of lessening the traffic on Beekman Avenue. It's also a way for pedestrians and cyclists and skateboarders and everybody else to get down to the new facilities that are being built there. Expect the road to go on, uh, begin construction later on this year. Uh, the property will, the rest of the property will be sold. Uh, it'll be put back on the tax rolls. So it'll, it'll be a revenue generator for us. It is likely to be mostly residential um, and, slight, and maybe a small component of commercial. Thank you. Ken, many possibilities have been shared for a, no, a mobility lane that connects the north end of Sleepy Hollow at Phelps to the south end at Patriots Park to provide protection for cyclists, as well as continuous sidewalks for pedestrians. What leadership role will you take with the state in planning improvements for, rate, for Route 9? Uh, we've already taken um, those steps with Route 9. We've been working with DOT for many years to improve uh, the safety um, of pedestrian cyclists and people who drive through Sleepy Hollow. Uh, the first part of it was uh, moving from two lanes from uh, the Old Dutch Church north to Phelps Hospital um, to get that into a, one lane in both directions with turn lanes. It's had a, a really great effect on safety in that section. What we'd like to see is an extension of that from the old Dutch church or the Pearson uh, Route 9 intersection up to 448 or the top of Beekman Avenue with the same thing, to move it down to one lane in both directions with appropriate turn lanes at the intersections as we go through. We're also working on new sidewalks in front of um, HHV or historic Hudson Valley. We received a grant to do that. That is the most critical part of the village when it comes to pedestrians because hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands of people travel through there. So we need to um, safe, uh, create that uh, as a new safe haven. Um, there is uh, some proposals for um, uh, interesting, I guess, is the best way I could say it for, for bike lanes. Um, I'd be interested in Martin's um, thoughts about the protected lanes on Bellwood Avenue and some of the other things um, that are uh, being proposed. Thank you. Uh, Martin, do you have any creative ideas to addressing parking issues and traffic congestion, especially during the fall tourist season? I think we, I think you have to go back to the question. I didn't answer the previous one. Ah, oh, I apologize. It's okay. Oh, Can you read it? Many possibilities have been shared for a mobility lane that connects the north end of Sleepy Hollow at Phelps to the south end at Patriots Park to provide protection for cyclists, as well as continuous sidewalks for pedestrians. 
What leadership role will you take with the state in planning improvements for Route 9? Thank you. I believe first it is the active and proactive work with the Department of Transportation. Route 9 has improved over the years. We went from four lane, two lanes in each direction to what we see today. But I think we have a lot to go. People are afraid to ride bikes on Route 9. I'm afraid to ride a bike on Route 9. There are crosswalks that are, are dangerous and scary. Many of those in the, in the intersection of Bedford, uh, New Broadway, and uh, Beekman Avenue. In fact, that intersection also causes a large amount of congestion as we work into the sleep, busy, sleepy holiday season. What I do believe is that mobility and walkability is your primary focus of any government in today's age. We need to make sure that people can, can get to our community. And it's a part of the reason I want to live here. We want to make sure it's safe to walk no matter where you want to walk. And it's also find ways to connect with other parts of the village. So yes, I agree, but mobility lane is interesting. I think it has to be worked together with Terrytown to create one that connects to the bridge. And if we can find a way of doing that, and it will have to be creative, um, it's, it's a very big sacrifice of parking. It's a very big community investment in the future of how we want to commute inside of our village. But as a community, we agreed to do that. I think we can then siphon economic development from the bridge and bikers moving forward who really want to explore the northern part of uh, Sleepy Hollow and into our part of the village and bring their money with them. Thank you. And again, apologies for uh, messing up the order there. No worries. Um, now, Martin, do you have any creative ideas to address parking issues and traffic congestion, especially during the fall tourist season? Yes, actually, I think it comes back to that intersection. One of the biggest um, areas I have seen is yet again, that intersection at the top of Beekman. I think we really do need to lobby the Department of Transportation to take a hard look at that intersection for how quickly and how, how we can adjust the traffic. Second, parking is a big part of our Beekman Avenue and my revitalization plan. We have to be focusing on bringing additional parking. So when people from outside of our village show up, they have a place they can park, they can get to our, get to our village and they can understand where they wanna go and experience the wonderful community that is Sleepy Hollow. I think we should work with our Board of Education. They have voiced multiple times. I know it's gonna be slow going in government, but the ability and the need to wanna to look at more school and maybe move it to somewhere else. We should be proactive in that communication and bringing and uh, talking with them about using their existing parking lot and maybe expanding it to give us additional uh, parking spaces without sacrificing the wonderful parks and the core of our community. Additionally, if we move that piece of property in, onto the tax roll, it'll help our long-term financial um, stability and ensure that we have new, interesting and fun play, places to interact with commercial and residential uh, inside that historic building. Thank you. Ken, creative ideas to address parking and traffic congestion, especially during the tourist season? Uh, you're on mute, Ken. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Um, we have been um, experimenting with some of those already. Um, we have a senior van that um, is fairly active during the week. And what we've been doing in the peak season of September and October and into November, we've been using our senior van uh, as a shuttle um, through the village. So running out to the Phillips Manor train station, uh, back down to Beekman Avenue, Cortland Street, Valley Street, and back around again as a free shuttle. Uh, as a way of encouraging people to hop on and off and not have to drive. So that's both village residents and people coming in from out of town. Clearly in those in the peak season, it's people from out of town. So um, that is something that I look at as um, continuing um, and expanding um, where we can. Um, I, I would point out that we already work with the Board of Education, uh, more school we use as a parking lot already. Um, every day. Um, so that's already an ongoing uh, piece for us. Um, and I would point out that with the New York Forward grant, the four and a half million dollar grant that we just got, that's going to focus on economic redevelopment in our downtown, that is going to be one of the things that we will look at. And now we will have one of the important tools, the money, to be able to help us to implement um, those measures. Thank you. Ken, what will you do to encourage businesses to fill the empty storefronts in the village? 
Do zoning laws need to be updated to allow for more full service restaurants? If parking is a consideration, would an Uber or Lyft drop off zone be created? Uh, on the last question, perhaps <laughs> the, the first part of it um, is I go back to um, the uh, New York Forward um, process. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, it is a New York State grant that we recently were awarded after many years of effort to get there, um, to get that. Uh, a lot of work went into it. Um, it will focus on our downtown, primarily Valley, Cortland, and Beekman, so the commercial part of Sleepy Hollow, where the restaurants, for the most part, are. Um, we would be... Um, uh, we're going to be looking at ways through a very public plan planning process throughout the rest of the year as part of that grant and how we can enhance and uh, new businesses. But more importantly, how can we support the businesses that are already here and the residents are already here? Um, the uh, process um, for some of um, the more perhaps interesting things like lift drop off and so on will be um, part of that planning process. Um, so I encourage everyone to um, uh, be part of that process when we, when we get started, uh, probably in early uh, summer in June when we move forward with that. Thank you. Martin, what will you do to encourage businesses to fill the empty storefronts in the village? Do zoning laws need to be updated to allow for more for full service restaurants? And if parking is a consideration, could an Uber Lyft drop off zone be created? Great. Thank you. What we need first, let's talk about ways of bringing in new businesses. One of those ways that we've, we should be talking about is creating templates. What that is, is we work cooperatively with as a, as a government with our bank planning and our, our zoning board to create pre-approved templates for empty lots, like the one next to Fleetwood that's been there almost a decade or more. What we can do is create a look of how that, that building could be uh, laid out, lay out what is there, work together, and have a pre-approved uh, uh, plan. That can be then socialized out with developers. And what they're going to have is that, that feeling like, yes, I know I can get this through. We will stand behind that plan, and they can do their own calculations on return on investment. What we then also have to do is look at parking. Parking, it again, is a big piece. We don't have enough parking for our current residents in the downtown. We need to, when I talked about Morris, I'm talking about expanding the parking at Morris so there's more of it. It's a great place to go underground if we can afford it. We can also go beyond Uber and Lyft, which we all know, especially in busy times, it's hard to get in our, our neighborhood if you don't pre-plan for it. We should be bringing in bike racks and improving our sidewalks all the way down to the edge on Hudson, not stopping part of the way through the village. We need to make sure that those sidewalks also extend down Valley and Cortland. Is there a, a valuable portion of our inner village and really should be more focused on for the decorations and other parts of our village, especially in, in October? So we appear more welcoming, more uh, cleanly. And what we really want to be as we you know, continue this evolution of Sleepy Hollow towards where we want to go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Martin. Oh, I'm sorry. Ken, would you like your second rebuttal? Yes, I would, please. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to add um, that uh, the comprehensive plan that we recently updated um, has a number of recommendations in it, fairly specific rec recommendations regarding zoning in our downtown. Um, so there is a uh, plan that was was contributed to by, by the entire village, um, very specifically in different um, areas of the downtown. And we have begun the implementation of that already. Thank you. Um, Martin, what opportunities do you see to create more affordable housing in the village? Affordable housing is wonderful. I think it's a big thing we need to account for. So this village of Sleepy Hollow is expensive. It's actually one of the most expensive. We look at a comprehensive plan, places to own in the river towns. What we need to do is look at ways of leveraging our plan for developers. One of those things can be as we move and expand to move the department of DPW away from River Street over to the East Parcel, we can then look at that area for development. And we need to make sure we don't stand by a small amount of affordable and workforce housing we currently have in, on Edge on Hudson. 
We have 62, I believe, uh, units there. And that's less than right around 6%. We need to be targeting 10% of our uh, affordable housing for every new development that comes in to make sure everyone can, if they want to stay in our village, has a way of doing so. We can also make sure that our comp plan outlines a lot of great ideas for how to develop our village, but that's not a action plan. What we need is the comprehensive plan put into discrete milestones, discrete actions that we can, as a community, understand, see, and track. Well, we've had a comp plan since 2018. And we, I don't feel in my mind that we've had the traction we could have. If we work together as a community, we can take those individual portions of our comprehensive plan and make that action plan that we can all track, understand, and measure our progress together. Thank you. Ken, opportunities that you see to create more affordable housing in the village. Well, again, um, I, I would look at our downtown where there are large tracts of uh, vacant land or underutilized land. Uh, and I don't mean the, the storefronts on Beekman Avenue, which are rather small, um, but there's an opportunity to do things there. And those, again, are in the New York Forward Grant area. So those are things that we're going to be looking at very closely. We also included those areas in our grant application. So we've already identified them as areas where we can build additional housing and additional retail along Portland and along Lower Valley. So we're already working on that. And it's one of the reasons I think that we got the grant is because we identified those areas. I think also we have to recognize the fact that there are over 340 units of permanently affordable housing in Sleepy Hollow already. And by permanently affordable, I mean the North Terrytown Housing Authority, Senior Building Next Door, the College Arms, um, those are permanently affordable units. And it seems to get lost in the shuffle when the state is coming out with mandates and other kinds of things or attempting to come out with them. You know, we are doing an enormous amount already and they have done already. Um, so we are already at this point with the uh, edge units, over 10% of the units in Sleepy Hollow are already permanently affordable. Thank you. Ken, a resident has heard of an open spaces committee that influences development in the village, but can't find any information about it on the village website. Please talk about how the public is formed, is informed of the activities of village committees any openings on the committees and the qualifications to have appointed them, to be appointed to them, I apologize. Sure. Um, it's not so much influencing development in the village. Um, and let me explain the origins of the Public Space Council. Um, on, along the River Walk, in, uh, along Riverside Drive in Phillips Manor, um, there was an old um, sidewalk um, that was unused because it was in horrible shape. Uh, we got a grant, uh, we matched it with some funds, and we rebuilt that sidewalk into a wonderful new space. At the time, we had a volunteer group of citizens, residents, who stepped up and said and helped with the design process um, to um, so that there was input on what the final design would be, and they did a great job. We had another uh, opportunity to extend that because of the bridge over um, uh, at Lower Beekman that goes to Edge, and the developer was required to redo that bridge. Um, we used, uh, again, a variation of that same then ad hoc committee uh, to help with the design there and decided, you know what, this is a good, useful advisory group to have, and we use it for village projects to look at it and then advise us, the trustees or the planning board. Um, if one goes to village meetings, you can hear reports on that, or you can watch them on the website, um, or you can watch old meetings as well. If you want to be a member, uh, what's required is being um, interested and in caring deeply about the village, and you can reach out to me personally. Thank you. Martin. A resident has heard of an open spaces committee that influences development in the in the village, but can't find any information about it on the village website. Please discuss how the public is informed of the activities of village committees, of any openings on the committees, and the qualifications to be appointed to them. Thank you. I think what, what you've highlighted here is an opportunity for us to improve how we communicate with our community. 
we need to take that feedback well. We need to improve how we communicate out that information and understand that you're right. It is an open space committee. It influences many things, but there's also many other uh, committees on our in our village that are also just as important and have had open, open spaces until recently. Those are the zoning and the planning board. Those have even more uh, power than the open space committee and should be populated by people who do care deeply about our village. I think we have the advantage of having a huge number of volunteers that selflessly dedicate their time. I think that should be celebrated, but also we need more of them every single day. We need to make sure that the people who have those skill sets are encouraged by the leadership style to dedicate their time, encouraged to and empowered to make those decisions um, freely and to be overseen by not just uh, the mayor, but the, villa, but the board of trustees in general. And that's what we should do when we wanna get an appointment. It should be an appointment not by you know, reaching out to just the mayor, they should be able to reach out to the local trustee. We have a, luck, a lucky big set of uh, trustees, of six of them, and they're across our overall um, uh, neighborhoods inside of the Phillips Manor, inside of Weber Park, the inner village. And we can use them better to make sure that you as a resident have many different ways of engaging and ensuring that if you want to uh, donate your valuable time, we are more than happy to find a place where you can do so. Thank you. Uh, Martin, what are your thoughts on opening marijuana dispensaries in Sleepy Hollow? And what, if any, restrictions do you think should be involved and enacted? That's a great question, one I haven't heard before. Um, I actually think marijuana, it would given us recent uh, legalization is something that should be explored. Um, if we're gonna, as a community and as a society, decide that marijuana is an available uh, substance that we wish to allow, once it's decriminalized and made available, which I believe it has been, I think we should look at the commercial viability of that and make sure that we as a community open a public uh, referendum, a public uh, hearing and overly communicate it. If as an overwhelming number of people, we wish to have a dispensary, I'm okay with that. I think it's something that as a community, we have to accept just like alcohol and other things that are our overall societal uh, norms towards uh, these different substances have altered over time. And uh, as a friend of mine once said, I've never seen someone get in a fist fight after smoking marijuana, but I've seen it after uh, doing alcohol. So we need to make sure that one, we start to plan for it, uh, make sure that we can tax it appropriately and integrate it in a seamless way inside of our village and our commercial district. Thank you. Ken, your thoughts on opening marijuana dispensaries and what, if any, restrictions you think should be enacted? Well, I think there's um, two sets of restrictions. There's ours and there's the state's. Um, clearly, uh, a license will come through the state much like it does um, for a liquor store or for a liquor license in a bar or restaurant. So the state is going to decide who is allowed to open a legal dispensary uh, for starters. If the part for us is zoning, much like um, how we zone our commercial businesses um, throughout the village. Um, we're going to have to um, address it in in that way. Um, the uh, uh, the real issue for me um, is is not so much either one of those, but some of the other pieces of this um, that kind of got dropped on us as a village when uh, cannabis, marijuana, other cannabis product product uh, products were. Um, approved and legalized quite suddenly uh, by then Governor Cuomo. Uh, it made it legal for people to light up on the street anywhere in the village, um, which you can't do with alcohol. You can't walk down the street with a bottle of Jack. Um, you know, you can't have a beer, but you can light up um, a, a marijuana product on the street. I think that's really um, a, a problem for us. Um, and I think also it's going to be a problem for law enforcement because there's no marijuana equivalent of DUI or DWI testing yet. Thank you. Thank you. Last question, because uh, we are just about over, a little over the time limit. Um, Ken, how would you respond to the perception that the village code is not enforced or is selectively enforced for things like garbage, littering, use of amplified music and parking. What is your view on enforcing village rules and who should be in charge of enforcement? 
Well, the enforcement is split up among um, existing village um, departments already. Um, and of course, we could always have better um, coordination with everything that we do. There's always room for improvement in any part of the village, uh, including in its governments. Um, the, um, some of the things um, you mentioned are um, things that would be enforced by our police department. Um, and others are part of our uh, building department. Um, so the um, issues for us are making sure that we hit the right people um, with um, enforcement um, activity um, and that we're consistent with that. And I think we could always be better in that area. Um, again, it kind of comes back to um, what's ex um, considered acceptable um, by certain um um, store owners or by their customers or by our own residents. Uh, and it unfortunately, the rest of us have to live with people who choose to litter uh, and trash our community and we have to pick up after them. Uh, that's going to be a difficult thing to legislate away or enforce away. Uh, but I think that we can continue um, with the efforts that we have underway uh, to make sure that these things are properly addressed. Thank you. And Martin, how would you respond to the perception that the village code is not enforced or is selectively enforced for things like garbage, littering, use of amplified music, and parking? What is your view on enforcing village rules and who should be in charge of that enforcement? Thank you. The primary place that all of us are going to look at for enforcement of rules and laws is going to be our police department. They are the many times the first uh, line of defense on those things. We're going to want to make sure we improve their morale, that they understand that as a community, we're giving them all of the ability, all of the uh, sources and training they need, all of the uh, uh, community uh, efforts and uh, support from social and other work, other parts of our uh, community uh, government to make sure they can do their job easily. Then we need to also make sure that we leverage our DPW. Sometimes when we, you sit there and you use you see something on the street, you don't pick it up, but we should incentivize our DPW to make sure that they see something, they pick it up, they say something, and we can create a more uh, together, create a cleaner, uh, more uh, happy community. But also, as we go through uh, enforcement, it needs to be equal. It doesn't shouldn't matter whether you rent, whether you own, or where you live in our village. Laws are laws, and we should treat that rule of law as an equality. It shouldn't be ever should be selectively enforced. But also, if we have tickets, they should be collected. They should be easy to pay online and enforced and make sure that we take that revenue and reinvest it into our community and our development of our economic situation. Thank you. OK, we've now reached our closing arguments. Um, I'll remind you that you each have 90 seconds for your close. And uh, Martin, you can go ahead first, please. Thank you. First, thank you to everyone who took the time out of their day to be here. It's a, a statement about the village of Sleepy Hollow and how much we all care. And that's what I want to represent, an improving uh, Sleepy Hollow that takes our existing DNA and turns it into a better version of uh, Sleepy Hollow tomorrow. I plan on planning for the long term, not today and not tomorrow. But also, I want to say that I want to bring a fresh new voice to our village government. And I believe that in 14 years, we've had the consistent government, but it's time for that to be replaced. It's time for us to take the opportunity to leverage our consistent uh, trustees and create a new leadership and a new vision for the, for the community that is, that is really leveraged by fresh new insights and ideas. Thank you. Ken, closing statement. Uh, thank you. And thank you all for participating this evening. Um, I think this election is really about results versus rhetoric. Uh, in the five years that Martin has lived here, he's never involved himself in local government except now to become mayor, which I find to be an interesting leap. Uh, he never asked to be considered for the zoning or planning boards, didn't volunteer to serve on the ad hoc committee to guide the process of developing our new comprehensive plan hasn't shown that he can build consensus, which is critical for a mayor who's just one vote of seven on the board of trustees. Think about that when you talk about appointments. Um, he doesn't have the relationships that I've forged. That's the reason why I've been endorsed by New York State Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins, 
by County Executive George Latimer, State Senator Pete Harkham, and Assemblywoman Mary Jane Shimsky. I like Martin. You're articulate, you have an analytical mind. And after this election, I hope you will ask to join one of our boards, planning or zoning, and experience and learn about village government. Thank you all. And for both of us, please get out and vote on Tuesday next week. Can I use Thank you. Rebuttal? Um, I believe you may have a rebuttal. I'm just going to check with our fearless leader, Susan. Uh, I would think you are allowed to have a rebuttal to that. Having not heard otherwise, <laughs> uh, you may go ahead with your 30 seconds. Thank you. I do a lot inside this community. Please don't underestimate the what it takes to walk into a burning building and dedicate the hundreds of hours it takes to do that. It takes consensus to be elected as chief. It takes consensus to build the community that I built inside of this run for mayor. The, my choice to not uh, run for trustee is based on my belief that the most good I can do is to face, change the leadership style inside our village to enable our community, our boards, and our uh, trustees to be more free with their thoughts uh, and make more changes inside what we do. In short, it's time thank, for a change. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, to wrap up, I uh, first want to remind you that the election day is next Tuesday, the 21st, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. And if you are unsure of your polling place, please look at vote411.org for information. Um, finally, I want to thank our candidates, thank our audience, and thank the helpers at the League um, who have really facilitated this whole process. And that includes our timekeeper, our tech specialists, um, our translator, and our signer. I wish you all a very pleasant evening. And my last quote for you is that democracy is not a spectator sport. We encourage you to get out and vote. Thank you very much.